Awesome. Looks like we're good to go. Well, we're going to go ahead and jump right in. Welcome to Data Over Instinct 2020. We are so excited um, that all of you have chosen to join us today. We know that 2020 has been really weird for everybody. And so whenever we put out the agenda for our two-day event, yesterday was our half-day pre-summit focused on healthcare. And then today, of course, is the full agenda. We really weren't sure how many people were going to attend because to be honest with you, I know everybody has been inundated with Zoom invitations and um, basically are kind of getting a little bit of screen fatigue. So we were so excited when over 230 people registered for this event. And we are seeing marketers from across the country register to be able to tune in to today's agenda. Just a little bit of summary about the content you're going to see today. Uh, this agenda was really created for marketers that want to become more data and analytics savvy. So think about marketers that have more traditional education and experience like PR communications, really wanted to move into more of a measurement philosophy for their marketing spend. We have people registered all the way down from the specialist role all the way up to chief marketing officers at some large organizations. So really excited for the learnings that are going to happen today. Uh, whenever we put the agenda together, I decided to make uh, my presentation first. So uh, this is content that I am asked about regularly, kind of a foundational 101 for marketing analytics, because all of the sessions we have later throughout the day are going to become um, a little bit more technical. We're going to have Lucky Orange is going to be presenting, talking about website optimization. Um, we have a gentleman presenting after that, talking about really technical measurement terms like customer lifetime value and how to actually get there and optimize your spend accordingly. And so I really wanted to back up a little bit and start at the 10,000 foot view and make sure that we have a solid foundation of understanding across all of our attendees of what marketing intelligence actually is and what technology is needed and included in order to make it work. So I'm going to, with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to jump into my presentation. Nope. Hang on one sec. Oh, okay, one sec. And a quick little one, pulling this up, a quick little housekeeping item. We have each new session starting at the top of the hour. And then um, we will, here we go, give about 10 minutes of content between each of the, hang on, my share screen went away, between each of the presentations. So it should give you plenty of time to be able to um, use the restroom, grab something to eat, um, or whatever you need to do, that way you're able to uh, move seamlessly from, that, from one session to another. So here we go, uh, Marketing Analytics 101. So let's dive right into it. So this is one of my favorite sayings. Um, often people ask whenever we get started with a measurement strategy for them, why it takes so long to start building dashboards. And the reason why is if you don't know what you're measuring or why, um, or what your goal is with the project, then you definitely aren't going to get there in a straightforward manner. So if I had eight hours to chop down a tree, I'd spend six of those sharpening my ax. We think of that as we'll spend six of those cleaning up the data, making sure things are tagged appropriately, make sure we understand our goals of the visualizations, and then we'll actually move in to the creation of the dashboards, not the other way around. So today we're gonna to talk about five key things. We're gonna talk about first the marketing analytics maturity scale, why we created it, and help you understand where you fall within that. Software and tools, leveraging a MarTech data warehouse. Those are a lot of words. If you aren't uh, involved in marketing analytics yet, I'll help you understand what that means. Or talk about some regulations. You can't just go around and willy-nilly measure people's web activity. Um, so we're going to talk about what regulations you should be on the lookout, especially based off what industry you're in. We're going to talk about building an internal team to accomplish this goal versus hiring an external partner and the pros and cons for each. I even have some job titles and salary expectations if you go the route of building an internal team. And we'll talk about prioritization of roles if you're going that route as well. 
And then we're going to talk about building a data first marketing team. So with the people you already have, what are some things that you should do in order to make sure that they are uh, ready and prepared to transition into this data first marketing world? So vanity metrics make you feel good, but they don't offer clear guidance for what to do. Um, I love this quote. It's a really easy way to get people to understand the difference between meaningful metrics and vanity metrics. Most of the time, whenever we come in and start looking at a um, marketing dashboard or report that people have been using for their campaigns, when they hire us to bring me in, even just as a friend or consultant, to give advice as far as uh, how they should improve their measurement, most of the time it's vanity. So these are the kinds of things that you don't mind being published online or sharing with your competitors. How many website visitors you got? Um, how much money you spent on each ad platform? Maybe you don't want competitors to know that, but like it's not going to actually give you clear guidance on what's driving revenue for your business. And so instead, you need to start shifting your measurement to what actually offers real value. So instead of talking about spend, impressions, clicks, and even website visitors, you want to talk about engagement metrics. So that's the actual sales and transactions that happened. Thanks that customer lifetime value. And we'll again get into that. We have a whole session talking about how to get to more advanced metrics like that. And then things like return on investment per campaign or marketing contribution margin. Um, I guarantee you that as a marketing leader, if you start measuring your campaigns with these more sophisticated metrics, uh, your leadership team within your organization will have massively more respect for marketing as a function, and you will be allotted more budget and be able to do a lot more fun campaigns because, again, you're showing them the why for the spend. Um, so, first of all, I'm going to back up a little bit. We hear these terms thrown around all of the time, report or dashboard. They'll say, hey, I want a great report that shows this, or I want a great dashboard that shows that. Let's back up. What do those terms actually mean. So here's where we start with the 101. And uh, Brett Lohmeyer, our director of decision science, actually came up with this analogy and I stole it from him. I use it all the time. <laughs> so thank you, Brett. Um, but imagine um, you didn't actually tune in today for Zoom. You actually had to come to Cortex, where our event was last year in St. Louis, and you were driving down the highway and you're running a little bit late. So maybe you're going a little faster than you should have. Um, you look up and all of a sudden you see cop lights in the rearview mirror. You look down at your dashboard and you see, oh my gosh, I was going uh, 10 miles over the limit, put on your blinker, brake, turn over, whatever. Come up, uh, no matter how good you are at sweet talking, you're going to get a ticket anyway. Um, the ticket actually says where you were and how fast you were going and how much your fine is going to be. That ticket that they write you is a report. It's a snapshot in time of what happened at that moment. When you were driving and you looked down at your car dash, it told you how fast you were going at that moment. But as you started to slow down, it changed and it actually uh, went down in speed. You also could see how much gas you had real time. You could see the temperature of your engine, all of these other things that real time changed based off of the situation. So that's a really easy way to think of it. A ticket or a report is a snapshot in time. So maybe it was last month's performance, last year's performance, last quarter's report performance. Whereas your dashboard is something you can pull up at any time and see what's happening now. Now, maybe you can change the dates on that dashboard to look historically and be able to understand, okay, using this dashboard, maybe I want to see right now months to date, but then also maybe I want to look at last month. That's still a dashboard. If you export that report of last month, that's generating a report. So hopefully that will help you a little bit whenever you are uh, working with your team and defining your needs for measurement um, for communication within your organization. Okay, I have to say, first of all, you are not supposed to be able to read or understand anything with this. It's supposed to overwhelm you. Um, with your marketing tools, imagine each of these boxes being a different tool or a different database you have access to. So here's where we're going to start defining the difference between analytics and business intelligence. So each of these reports itself, or each of these, sorry, databases itself, you could pull analytics from. So for example, imagine that one in the green is Google Analytics. Imagine the blue is MailChimp or whatever your email marketing tool is. Imagine the big yellow one down below is Google Ads, because you spend a ton of money there for lead generation or e-com. Imagine the pink one is actually, um, let's say, your, um, your customer sales database, where you're actually tracking transactions 
over a period of time for the history of your relationship with those customers. Each one of those databases, as you can see, are completely separate and they live in different places. They aren't touching. And so it's actually kind of funny when we start working with new customers, one of the first things we have to figure out is who has access to all of these databases, what databases exist, um, and how do we get the keys to the castle? So how do we get the administrative login to each of them? The value of business intelligence is whenever you pull each of those boxes and you go through these process, this process, one, two, three, make it really simple. So you take each of those boxes from the last screen and then you do step number one, you extract it. You pull the data from each of those separate disparate databases and pull them in to a data warehouse. Because the only way you can run reports across multiple databases is if they're all in one place. So you pull the data from each of those different databases, the MailChimp, the Google Ads, the customer database, pull it all into one, into one warehouse. And then you have to actually normalize and clean the data up. That's basically a fancy way of saying that you need a way to know Jenny whenever I'm in Google Ads, whenever Jenny is uh, in email marketing, whenever Jenny's in the customer database, you have to have a key to connect all of them. And that's easily done. Sometimes it's the email address. Sometimes you create an anonymized key that chat tracks the user together, but you have to have some way to make all of these databases connect to each other in the warehouse. That's when you can do cool visualization. That's when you can look at customer lifetime journey and say, how did Jenny find us? How did Jenny interact within each of these separate places? And then how did her journey and her conversion differ from Joel? And what did that look like? Who was more profitable? Who do we have to spend more marketing dollars to convert? Um, they're in the other room. That is my son, Joy's of working from home. My child is on his way to go get braces for the first time, which is so much fun. I think they're in the bathroom in the mudroom, buddy. <laughs> working parent life. And then, and only then, can you actually do step number three, which is analyzing and understanding, uh, again, those customer journeys, and then start doing those cool calculations. So something we hear all the time is, can't I just buy Tableau? Like, can't I just buy Domo? Can't I just buy one of these super expensive business intelligence tools and, you know, plug it in, give them my username and passwords and be done? No, because if you don't go through those steps of extracting the data and putting it all in one warehouse and cleaning it up, your data is not going to be accurate. You're going to be at the point where your executives are going to not trust the dashboards because when they do calculations on their own, it doesn't match the dashboard because nobody took that time to clean everything up. And that's a situation we see so often. People spend tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars on fancy software, but they don't understand the data cleanup and normalization process behind the scenes. And they just expect they can plug it all in and it will work. So when you're going through this process, it's very, very important to spend a couple of months cleaning up the data and getting things ready to go before you jump into a tool like Tableau. And Tableau is awesome. We really like Tableau. To be honest, we normally use Power BI more often because most of our clients have it for free as part of the Microsoft account. And we rather them spend money on training their internal people to use BI versus paying the platform. But Tableau is great too. But again, none of those tools are good out of the box. You have to clean up your data and feed it into that before you are able to get meaningful insights. So here's a good example. Because a lot of times people say like, well, I don't understand, like, how are you going to tie people like Jenny through her user journey? And here's how. So the horizontal box is a screenshot of the kind of data you can get out of Google Analytics. So if you actually log into Google Analytics and you're using their user interface, you might go to referral source and this is what you'll see. It says, here's where all of our traffic came from. Here's the number of clicks, blah, blah, blah. The one behind it is what you actually can get if you export the information using their API into your data warehouse. If you look over on the far right, there's a profile ID and there's a variety of other columns that you don't get in the visual interface. That's where more advanced calculations can happen. So the user interface, a good way to think of it is it's like a, um, a bike with training wheels, right? It's ready to go. You can hop on it. doesn't matter if you practice, doesn't matter if you have good balance and you have the ability to be successful at least to a point. But when you really want to start getting granular, you have to export the data from the platform and from the source itself to be able to get that extra information, all of those extra columns to tie it to user behavior and have it be more of a holistic view. 
So hopefully all of that makes sense. Here's a really cool screenshot and example of some things that you can do uh, once you pull all of those different databases together. So this database, for example, we were looking at customer lifetime value. Um, and so that means uh, in lifetime, it's kind of funny, lifetime means different things to different companies. For this company, um, we are actually looking at a trailing uh, 12 months. Um, and that is for a couple of different reasons. But for their business, it's an uh, e-commerce business, we actually had very specific parameters what lifetime meant. But in order to make this dashboard, we had to pull all of their advertising platforms. So think Google Ads, Facebook, Instagram, they even spent money on Amazon ads. All of that information, all those databases had to be pulled together. Then we had to get their customer order database. So how much they spent on marketing, how much revenue they actually derived from selling to these people, and we had to tie all of them together, right? So we had to know how much they spent versus how much they made. Here you can see a cool story. Um, the products are what the bars are across. And so the prior agency that this company was working with told them that out of, let's say, 12 products, five of them were the, um, the first products people usually buy to do business with this company. So it's kind of like the entry point for new consumers. Um, another agency was working with them before and they found that four out of the five had the lowest cost per sale. So I could sell to Joe for $20. I could sell to Mary for $20. Across the board, it was cheapest to sell these four products out of the 12, the initial time. That's, good. That's a great starting point, right? To understand how much it actually costs the marketing dollars in order to generate a dollar in revenue. is a, it's a, That's a huge step to get to that point. We took it a step further. We pulled all these databases together and we understood lifetime value. So based off of the initial product somebody purchased, what is the lifetime value of that person? And you can see the very top bar, it's $726. After that, it's $510. Uh, and then drops to $437. Those three, and especially that one, generated multiple dollars more per lifetime relationship of each new customer. And so it completely changed the way they were spending their marketing dollars. They were no longer thinking about who was the cheapest customer to get, because if you look at the chart, that actually was the bottom couple, where they only actually had lifetime values in the 200s. Instead, we started spending money for lifetime value of revenue, and then you can get to profitability later um, based off of the transaction. And so I know we're talking about a lot of really technical things here, but I wanted to really bring it home for you and help you actually visualize and understand the value of all these databases being tied together. Okay, let's now talk about the marketing analytics maturity scale. So many times I chat with marketing leaders, especially like CMOs or people high up in the organization, and they're creating their strategic vision for their team. And they say, we really, really want to get to automation and predictive analysis next year. That's our goal. We are going to train all of our people, and we're going to get to automation and predictive analysis. And so they say, Jenny, is that possible? Well, I sit down with them, and we wanted to create this visualization. That way you can understand what stair step you're on and what the next most logical step is before you're able to get to those cool upper steps. So at the very bottom, you can see we have foundational analytics. Measurement strategy. What are you measuring and why? That is the number one most important thing you have to do. That is the very bottom step. Getting your entire first marketing team and then leadership team and then organization to agree on what you're measuring and why and what the goals are. So you have what you're measuring, but then where do you want to be? So what are the KPIs? is a very important first step. You cannot go to the next step, which is dashboards and technical implementations until you're all on the same page. The next step at that point is stakeholder dashboards. And we really like to think of it as a couple of different dashboards. Senior leaders should have an executive level dashboard. Managers should have another level after that. And then operational folks who are actually managing the ads and the campaign should have another one. You don't ever wanna get, we'll talk about this a little more, but you don't wanna give executives full insight into Google Ads campaigns. There's no reason, they don't care about that. They just wanna know if you're making the money that you said you were gonna make with the campaign. After that, and then underneath that is technical implementation. So you have to do that before you get to the stakeholder dashboards. And that is that three-part process I talked about, cleaning up all the data sources, extracting them, um, and then doing the goal visualizations. Next, you can get up to the next step, which is diagnostic analytics. So first you do exploratory data analysis. Um, so this is whenever 
um, John from accounting comes up to you and he says, um, hey, I'm interested in understanding if this media platform that we spent money on generated any sales of this product. That is really just getting into the data. And that really goes down to saying triggered ad hoc analysis. It's like somebody just came up with an idea of something they want you to look at. It's not really tied to a specific KPI. You're just digging in for a person's one-time request. That's diagnostic, right? Like you're looking at the past, what happened? Um, historically, what happened with this campaign? Why did it happen? What can we learn from it to do future um, campaigns and change our strategy there? Business intelligence integration, of course, has to happen before those. So that's all in the same step of diagnostic analysis. You have your BI tool, you have your Tableau, you have your Power BI. Now you're gonna dig in and try to figure out like, now, what happened back then? What happened in February and March whenever COVID started, you know, ravishing all of our businesses? <laughs> and what was the impact to our business from a marketing perspective? That is the exploratory and triggered ad hoc. Next is forward looking, hypothesis testing. So once you have the ability to go backwards, let's start going forward. Hypothesis testing would be me coming, a good example is like me coming up with a hypothesis or an idea about how we can improve our marketing. So maybe it's a different call to action. Maybe it's a different uh, headline or a different audience targeting. And we have all the tools in place to run an A, B, or a multivariate test that is statistically significant that lets us know if that change performs better than our original version. So is the variant better than the original? And that's hypothesis testing. Um, we do a ton of conversion rate optimization, which is really looking at the performance of your website and coming up with hypotheses of how to improve the performance of your website before we do a whole website redo. No, no, no. Let's focus on the current state right now. You have to have all of those lower steps done to know that you're going to get the data you need to make that call. Next is automation. We just set up another client. Um, we've been working with them for maybe like four months or something, getting them all set up in BI tools, getting all their data cleaned up, basically going up each of the steps with them. And they went along pretty fast, actually. I think we've been working with them like eight months total, um, but really just four months on a retainer helping them with their analytics. And we implemented a bunch of automation over the last couple of weeks that is saving them like 10 hours a week for manual data pool. It is insane how much automation can save time for your marketing team. So thinking about, the, for the lower step, first passing data from system to system. So thinking about if you see a conversion over here because of a Google Ads campaign, your, dash, your tool can go back and tell Google Ads that that converted and optimize it, spend more money on it, or um, make sure that it's prioritized against other campaigns. That's passing data from system to system. So making sure that you're actually implementing cool changes to your marketing automatically based off what's working and not working. Also automating repetitive tasks. So think about like creating end of month or beginning of month reports and how long that takes you or somebody on your team. At this point, you can automate them. Next is predictive. Let's start making guesses scientifically about what will happen in the future. So first you can do predictive modeling for forecasting. If somebody says like, let's say your CFO wants you to create a predictive model of what the return would be if they gave you an extra half a million dollars to spend on your marketing budget. You will have all the data in place to do that predictive modeling accurately, or at least as accurately as predictive modeling can be. <laughs> it, it's modeling, it's never gonna be hundred percent, but you're not doing a shot in the dark you have data to back up that predictive modeling. It's pretty exciting. And then also prescriptive analytics based on machine learning. So that too is um, the machine and the software learning from your campaigns and then um, giving you ideas and optimizations for your programs. Um, and then finally, automation based on predictive modeling. So if you actually create a model, you can say if then, so if the cost per lead falls below this, then spend more money here. And so then you can actually drive automation that can make your marketing team much stronger than the actual number of heads in your team and your department. So pretty cool. But again, you have to identify where you are within this journey and be realistic with yourself. And as you're thinking about your next two to three years, you have to figure out what, how many steps up you want to be, what's your appetite within your team as far as becoming more sophisticated. And then you can start thinking about some key considerations. So first of all, the very first step was measurement strategy. And that goes to this question, how will you actually measure your marketing campaign performance? Are you gonna focus on website conversions, phone calls, form submissions? What tools are you gonna use to measure these? Where will you store your data? So 
uh, there's a lot of different options for data warehouses or data lakes. So there's a lot of different softwares like Google has options, um, Amazon has options. Um, it really is endless. We have a couple of favorites here at uh, Anvil as far as security, ease of use and cost. Um, but there are many options available. You need to understand the where you're going to store your data and make sure that you, everybody understands the um, security protocols of who has access to the data and why, um, and then what the costs and how to log in. Next is who will own your data. Please, if you have contracts with any agencies or outside partners, you need to make sure it's very clear in your terms of service that you own your data, not them. I've seen way too many people come to me for questions about marketing programs, and they didn't realize in the fine print the agency owned their data. And if they left them, they had to start over. They couldn't get any of that historical engagement data. So please make sure that you own your data yourself. How will you aggregate and normalize your data? So this is the um, ETL or ELT uh, extract transform load process that we talked about in yesterday's presentation, if you were there. You need to understand what tool you, tools you want to use for that and how it's going to fit into your marketing tech stack. And then big question, what platform will be your one source of truth for data? And this is important because if you're a marketer, you've been in one of those meetings where you're looking at campaign performance and somebody in the room is going to say, well, why does Google Ads and Facebook show different number of conversions in Google Analytics? You all know that. You've heard that before. The reason why is each platform is greedy. So each platform has different attribution models. For Facebook, if they've ever seen or touched that person, even if they weren't the last one that actually drove the conversion, they're going to take credit for it. Pretty similar with Google Ads. Google Analytics has a different model. So um, important to know which one is your source of truth, and that will stop that bickering in all of your meetings. You'll all understand the why behind the differences and really be on the same page. Um, and then we also recommend a tracking and analytics portal to keep track of data requirements, governance, so like naming conventions, making sure that you're uh, a good example. Yesterday, actually, Noah from University of Wisconsin walked through. This is one of their biggest hurdles. Every person on the marketing team was setting up tracking URLs differently. So one person for Facebook would do FB, one person would spell out Facebook, one person would do Facebook.com, one person would do FB ads, and all of those were Facebook ads. So governance means making sure everybody understands the rules and is adhering to it. And then implementation analysis. This could really be something as simple as a shared folder on your internal drive with a bunch of documents or one document that lists out like the rules of measurement. Hey, here's what we're doing and why. Um, we actually make custom ones for our clients uh, that live in a Google site or a couple of other different platform option, options that we use. Um, but you definitely need to track things because otherwise when one of your key analytics team members leave, you won't know what you're doing and you don't want to start over. Trust me, it's really painful when you have to do that. Now let's talk about regulations. I love this screen. It makes me smile every time. Um, <laughs> there were so many memes that went around whenever Facebook had to go in front of that Senate panel. Um, this one just made me laugh the most. Why won't my grandson accept my friend request? So this is a perfect example of how um, prior to 2018, before Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg had to actually go in front of the Senate to have a congressional hearing about uh, improper data sharing that was happening on their platform, the average American did not understand how their data was being aggregated, shared, and used. They really didn't. Many of them still don't, but this was really, in my mind, a turning point where people began to say like, oh, wait, those quizzes on Facebook aren't just for fun. Oh, wait, people can track me when I go on Amazon and don't buy something. That's why those ads show up. I just thought it was really a convenient, uh, it was a um, coincidence. So this was the minute moment that everybody began opening their eyes, but it was not the first moment of governance. It was not the first moment when regulations began and when you should have been adhering to the rules. But this is when Americans kind of woke up and were like, oh, there are rules about how we're doing this. And so collecting data isn't as easy as it sounds. I know it didn't just sound easy. For those of you that are not technical marketers, that sentence sounds pretty ludicrous to you, right? Because I just went through a bunch of really technical, nerdy slides, and now I'm saying it's not as easy as it sounds. So I apologize for those of you that are shaking your heads at me. But um, even if you understood all of the technical terms, or if you already have a team in place to do all of that for you, 
you still need to really be aware. So what we always tell our clients is that domestic legislation really is the immediate risk, but international legislation is close behind. So um, for example, let's talk about international first. So GDPR, do you guys remember last year when all of a sudden every app you'd ever downloaded or website you've ever created a username for sent you a new terms of service? Email, like we got so many emails within a period of two weeks, like Instagram has a new terms of service and Snap, whatever. That's because GDPR went into place. And GDPR stands for General Data Protection Regulation. It is an international, it's actually in Europe. Um, so it's a European rule, law, um, and it actually has a lot of really specific language around how you can collect user data, how you have to notify them that you're collecting data, and then how you can use it. Three really basic things, but none of those things were happening before. Um, so the California Online Privacy Protection, if we skip all the way down in that bullet, that is a, we call it GDPR light. So a lot of the things that are in GDPR are in the California Online Privacy Protection. And uh, so what we try to do with our clients, what I recommend to everyone is try to adhere to the uh, strictness of GDPR. And it's things like updating your terms of service, having clear language on any of your online forms about where the data is going and who's going to use it and if you're going to sell it. Like it's basically things we should be doing as we interact with other humans online. So we've been skipping the steps a lot. So try to adhere to GDPR because that legislation is moving to the U.S. Next is Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act, high tech, right? High tech is actually related to HIPAA, which if you're in the healthcare space, you know all about HIPAA. Um, again, basically, how are you collecting this information? Who has access to it? And how are you protecting it? It's much more specific if you're in healthcare in any way. I will tell you, we have seen some insane, insane breaches of HIPAA with some of our um, hospital and healthcare clients that have had us come in and do audits, but it wasn't because they were doing it on purpose. It was literally because their internal legal team was more focused on the clinical side and they kind of forgot about the marketing side or they didn't realize all the data that was being collected because the technology has advanced so much. So really make sure if you do anything in healthcare that you're aware of uh, how HIPAA impacts things like call tracking, form submissions, how agencies access that information or not. And then beyond legislation, there are other industry changes that can cause concern that you need to be aware about. So um, ITP. So ITP is basically a change to how cookies are shared online. So it used to be that if you actually uh, were on Facebook, went somewhere else, went to another site, Facebook could track all of those visits because you gave them permission to with the terms of service. Um, many people don't know that. Um, and so it's a browser's attempt basically to clean it up and protect the user's privacy a little bit. But as marketers, it's unfortunate because it means we can't track people as much as we could before. That's a change. The other change is Google Analytics has a new web and app tracking beta. It's in beta right now. We've been playing around with it a ton and we actually like it and prefer it to the current analytics platform, but it's a complete reimagination of Google Analytics. So if you're building out an entire measurement strategy right now with the current Google Analytics, you need to know at some point this new version may roll out. So that's one of the really cool things about this industry and one of the difficult things is things constantly change and shift and you have to stay up to date to make sure you don't run into any issues. So now let's talk about building an internal team versus hiring an outside partner. One of the big questions that you should be asking yourself about your own role and then your role of your marketing team within your organization is where are your efforts being spent versus what provides most value to your organization? So we listed here time spent in order of value and priority. If you start at the very bottom, this is the least valuable thing that your team members can be doing, but likely the thing they're doing the most, right? Basic report creation. How many hours are spent each month generating basic reports? A lot. Next, ad hoc requests. When John from finance wants a specific report, that's ad hoc, just came up with it. Never gonna need it again, but you have to do it. Next is data stewardship. So basically in wrangling, data stewardship and wrangling are very connected because it's basically making sure the data feeds continue to work. Facebook changes theirs like every four days and it breaks. So it's a, it's a full-time job almost. And then also making sure that within the organization, people understand why this data is important, how you're going to use it, where it's going to be stored. 
Then you finally have time for strategy and actually working with the leadership team and figuring out how your reports can be beneficial to them, how you should change dashboards. Then you can actually communicate those findings with the stakeholders because you know you have data that's meaningful to them. And then you can actually get into deep analysis where you're digging in and doing those cool things like the slide, that slide way back where I showed customer lifetime value and that one product was killing it. That company never would have had time to get there to understand that because they were always on basic report creation. They just didn't have the manpower internally. So whether you're going to hire internally or outsource, it's important to look at your team and figure out where are we spending time now, where do we need to get there, and what resources do we need in order to make it happen. One huge caveat, technical debt will drain your resources and create confusion. Technical debt is basically those changes and installs and implementation that you did in the past that did not have a strategy tied to them, that nobody is monitoring or keeping up. Um, it's basically like the old baggage in the attic, right? Like moving to a new house, you're like, I don't want to unload this stuff right now. Let's just put it in the attic. And then when you move in three years, no, hopefully not three years, when you move, they're going to have to deal with that technical debt again. And so um, one important thing to say is that as you're going through this process, it's a really good practice to just stop, clean out all those boxes, man. Like, look at that old box, unload it, figure out why this database exists, the old data that's in there. Do you need it? Can you delete it? Don't just keep things because you think one day you might need them. Start fresh. So key considerations if you're thinking about uh, building versus hiring a partner. First is budget. How much money do you have? How much can you get allocated for this problem to solve it? And that's his ability to manage or provide guidance. So um, as a perfect example, the very first data scientist that I hired was literally a data scientist. I mean, he had his master's degree. Um, he had no business experience though. And so I hired him and brought him in and he was a whiz at doing calculations, but he did not understand um, he did not understand how the business worked. And so it was really terrible because none of his insights meant anything. And I didn't have an, uh, that cross between yet at that stage of my career to give him the technical guidance to tell him what to look at and why to bridge the gap. So you have the ability to manage them and make them an effective team member. Next is internal technical support. Remember that slide that ex extract, transform, load, visualize, all those steps. If you don't have somebody within your organization that knows what that slide means and can explain to you why you use the tools that you use in each step, you need to look at either hiring somebody internally to do that or outsourcing it. It can't just be something that, um, you know, you kind of set up once and then forget it. And the next is reporting needs, which is, again, but like historic versus insight what's in there that we can use to modify in strategy. How are we going to be smarter moving forward? So really what you have covered internally now, and then if you're going to hire somebody or bring an agency in, what hole do you want them to fill and why? So when you're looking at building an analytics and insights team, there are uh, six different roles that we like to say would be the ideal team. And I'm sure there's more, but these are our six favorite. First, we're going to start at the top, business interpreters. These are people within your organization that actually can turn business questions into analytics projects. So the salary range is anything from 60 to 120. That's a really big range. But um, depending on how many years experience they have, they are the ones that actually understand both worlds, the business world and the analytics world, and they can help uh, bridge the gap. Governance manager, this is the person who really just creates rules and implements them on how data is managed. So um, remember that example about Facebook being spelled in 12 different ways? The governance manager is the one who would fix that and make sure it doesn't happen. And that ensures that your data and reports are clean. Data engineers, these are the people actually doing the collect, extract, process, and modeling of data. So it's ready for analysis. These are really, really, really smart people that understand the technical back end of pulling together these uh, reports and dashboards for you. Analysts and data scientists, this is the core team that finds insights and builds solutions. So they're the ones that actually look at the things the data engineers create and pull it together. Hypothesis tester, if you're going to go down the route of actually start optimizing your campaign based off of insights, this is a role within your organization that would be really cool. Because what they do is they say, hey, based off this, we're going to start running this test. And we're going to see if we can improve the website conversion rate by 0.5% with this test. 
Um, so they're the ones who come up with the ideas and manage the implementation of the test. And finally, reporting and storytelling designers. This is somebody who actually makes sure your reporter dashboard is in such a format that people can't wait to read it and see it. They think it is um, extremely helpful, extremely valuable for them. And every month or every week, whatever your cadence is to send out the dashboard or report, link to them, they want to pull it up and they actually are excited. So if you send something out via Excel and expect people to dig in, they're never going to do it. This role is somebody who can actually make sure it's worthwhile. So are you going to hire all six of these? Absolutely not. I mean, this is like a dream team. Many of you, though, will actually create, make multiple roles and squish it into one position because you have less data to work with. And so maybe three of these will actually be one higher. Or maybe you can actually uh, work with your existing development and technical team and have them serve as the data engineer if they have the correct technical capabilities in order to do that. So these are the roles you need to be successful, but they don't all have to be separate people, if that makes sense. So let's go through, let's see, it is 9.41. I'm going to go through just about five or 10 minutes of these quick tips and takeaways. So number one, if you are going through this process, as you're looking at now until the end of 2020, and even setting your goals for 2021, here's a handful of tips. First, understand who the reports are for and what their needs are. I mentioned earlier, but having a separate report for the executive team is so important compared to the operational team. The executive team doesn't need to know the cost per click. You don't want them focused on those granular details because you are the expert. You are the one who is going to be optimizing the campaign. You want them to see the results and the top line financials of what you were able to contribute. Um, start looking at that maturity stair step. And yes, we're going to email all these presentations out after the fact. So start looking at that stair step and figure out where you are and be honest. Where are you? Many of you will be at the bottom and that's okay. Or maybe step number two, figure out two to three years, where do you want to be? Start fostering buy-in and collaboration with other members of your uh, company and help them understand why you want to be there, what you need in order to get there as far as manpower and budget, and then start building it out. Every single person within your marketing and analytics, and I even say technical team, should be Google Analytics and Tag Manager certified. It's free. There's no reason not to do it. Um, and I say Google because the vast majority of everybody we work with is still on Google. A handful of people have upgraded to other platforms, so sometimes they even come back to Google. So Google, if that's where you are, be comfortable and happy being there. Um, if you grow up a little bit and your website becomes too advanced, there's a paid version of Google. Um, but most of you don't even need that, but become certified. Um, understanding how Google Tag Manager works will help you implement um, some of your hypothesis testing as well. So for example, um, the one of the later presentations is about customer lifetime value. Um, understanding how to put the right tools in place. Oh, actually, even better example. Next up is Lucky Orange. So we have Jordan presenting, talking about website optimization. You can install Lucky Orange so much easier if you have Tag Manager in place and know how to use it. Audit your Google Analytics setup and all media platform tags before a campaign launch. We actually help quite a few agencies across the country implement their digital campaigns from a technical and measurement perspective. And there have been multiple times where they've called us two weeks after a campaign launched and they pulled up that measurement dashboard for the first time that they did without calling us ahead of time, by the way. And the data is not aggregating correctly. It shows zero clicks through Facebook, even though they spent over half a million dollars. It happens. So make sure you audit all of these different platforms and know that the tools are ready to go before you flip the switch and start spending money. Track traditional campaigns too. So this is a really fun thing to think about once you nail the digital side, figuring out how to implement tracking for your traditional campaigns. Because everybody, not everybody, a lot of people are still doing traditional things like billboards, trade shows, mailers, even radio and TV spots. There are ways you can implement that into your digital tracking. Um, two different things, and we actually have somebody later talking about cohort analysis, so I'm not going to go into that too much right now, but basically identifying a group of people, and then you follow them through their journey and measure them separately from a normal user. And then the other one's day parting matchup. So if you know you have a radio or TV spot at certain periods of time and certain geographies, you can, again, like make cohorts and say, if anybody comes to the website, at this day and time from this location, they probably heard about us through the radio. And you can track their um, journeys. Lots of different cool ideas and ways. Those are just two uh, big picture ones. Work with your agency partners and your internal teams to make sure you're using the same data. I have seen this so many times. Um, agencies love to make themselves look good. 
and your internal team wants to make themselves look good, right? Like that's just human nature. So many times they will use data and interpret it to their best look. So you may have one person using one Google Analytics view and the other person using a different Google Analytics view, or maybe they aren't even using that. They're just using the Facebook ads data. You need to make sure everybody's reporting in the same framework that way you're comparing apples to apples. Otherwise, one campaign may look massively successful when in reality it's not doing anything. And it's just the way that they're using the data to make themselves look good or bad. So one thing that I recommend is to get all your agency partners in a room. And we work with some people that have like 12 agency partners. So get all your people in a room and tell them this is the Google Analytics view you're going to use. This is the dashboard you're going to use. And here's the auditing of the tags we're going to do for you before campaign launch. Just be really collaborative about it. Help make them understand that this is an opportunity for them to look good by comparing their campaigns accurately across the board. So um, develop automated reports. You can spend your time on insights versus report pulling. This is so helpful to do. But again, I think it was like step number four on the maturity chart. Um, so you need to do a couple of things before you can get there. But once you get there, you're going to love automated reports. It's going to save so much time and energy. And thank you. With that, we have a handful of minutes for questions. So as I am walking through the questions, if you have any questions, go ahead and throw them in the Q&A section. Looks like I have a couple that have been messaged to me already. Um, but if you have any, throw them in there and I'll start addressing them. So first one. Thinking about long-term goals or long-term metrics like customer lifetime value, what are some strategies for dealing with big external changes like a pandemic? That is an, it, that's an awesome question. And um, it's kind of interesting because we have our answer, but then I've also been watching how other large organizations and marketing uh, analytics teams have been handling this. And there doesn't really seem to be a consensus. Um, one example or one opportunity you can do is do um, historical reporting. That way you can um, start looking at year over year or even quarter over quarter impacts to be able to see what the big dip looks like. You also can do things like cohort analysis, which I strongly recommend, where you actually start looking how different groups of existing customers and prospects are engaging with you now compared to how they did historically. So um, with that, you can create a cohort, for example, of anybody who's ever bought from you in the past. Um, and maybe you want to break that down into separate groups. Like they bought from you repeatedly. They're like an evangelist. They buy every month on the month. Um, maybe they haven't bought from you in a while, but they've spent significant money. Um, there's another presentation later today, I think, that walks through the customer types. But maybe break them up and then track them differently um, and look at them historically year over year of how they've acted and responded. That we can get a feel for what the true impact is to your business. And that also can give you an understanding of what's happening within your current audience um, of customer base of maybe one customer segment is more impacted than the other based off industry, income, education level, if it's consumer based, and whatnot. That's really helpful. On the prospect side, it can be really helpful um, to look at, again, trying to break them down as granular as possible. And each business is going to be different. If it's healthcare, for example, you maybe break it down based off the specialty care, the kinds of care they're going to come to you for that you think they'll come to you for. Maybe break it down based off persona. Um, and again, looking at it according to year over year, if you have access to that data is one of the most reliable and uh, understanding at that point um, how much uh, of a variance you are year over year, um, but then also beginning to track the recovery. Because I know uh, across the board, about three to four weeks ago, we started to see a little loosening up of buying behaviors on the B2B side. Uh, B2C actually hasn't slowed down much in many e-commerce industries. Um, but that's one of the best tips is really thinking about if you want to cohort analysis and custom dashboards to be able to track that response. Um, another thing I'd always recommend if you're looking at something big picture like that is uh, making sure you're doing enough industry re research to see how conversion rates are trending and marketing spends are trending across the board. So there are a lot of tools out there that will allow you to see how much your competitors are spending on the different platforms month over month, week over week, and watch and see if it's changing in any direction. That's really helpful to do as well. So great question. Okay, Patrick says, we're a health system with a large BI team and IT database team. Have you seen it work well to have people in those departments handle ETL and data science tasks? Or do you advise the roles you showed always officially being on the marketing team? 
Great question, Patrick. So I'll tell you that we've actually um, helped or been some sort of role within multiple rollouts of business intelligence within relatively large healthcare organizations across the country. And in every single situation, the vast majority of these tasks and roles fell within the marketing team itself. But the successful uh, the thing that I've seen the most successful rollouts do is good collaboration with your existing internal team and making sure they understand, like, we want to use your existing processes and framework, and we want to be part of your team. We want to be collaborative partners, but we're going to own this ourselves. And then hiring or outsourcing to a specific group in order to do that specifically for marketing. And the reason is the data set so much smaller on marketing versus all the clinical and operational data they're dealing with. Some of the tools they use might not be appropriate for marketing data for a variety of reasons. Um, and then just making sure you can move at a faster pace and kind of prioritize your own stuff is another reason. But a couple of operational things that I've seen people do when they're rolling this out is um, making sure that the heads of the two departments have a lot of strategy sessions leading up to it about the why of wanting to have their own team and what collaboration will look like so everybody's on the same page. You don't want it to feel like it's a political move. And then making sure there's at least a bi-weekly half hour touch point, call, Zoom, whatever, um, where the two teams are getting together and talking about best practices, issues they're struggling with. You really want them to feel like it's a dotted line um, and they have some sort of uh, relationship that they owe each other. Um, so really, really important to do that. So, but anytime that I've ever seen um, it tried to be handled in-house, with your existing team, it's never prioritized um, because the clinical side, usually in operational side, uh, reporting always takes precedence. And normally we are called or we are brought in, even just myself as a friend with anybody in the healthcare space, um, in order to help them transition away from that because it's never worked. Um, but great question. Let's see, we probably have time for one additional question. If anybody has any, let me check my email real quick and make sure nobody's hit me up in any other areas. So um, one thing I just got an email about, if somebody wants to know what's the number one thing that newbies should be doing if they're super overwhelmed at watching all of this. And what I would say to the newbie, if you're watching this and my presentation so far has been overwhelming, number one, I apologize. I'm on my third cup of coffee, so I talked really quickly. Uh, but number two, I promise you that uh, the way to be successful with this is really a step at a time. So don't try to look at that entire measurement strategy all at once and say we have to do all of this before we can be successful. Step back and just say, today, I'm gonna to work on the measurement strategy. My goal between now and the end of the year is nothing but measurement strategy and getting Google Analytics and Google Tag Manager certified. That's awesome. That's a great first step. You'll come up with so many ideas and deepen your knowledge and understanding about the process in such a great way that the next step will see that will seem that much easier and more doable. So don't let any of this intimidate you. I promise it's possible. Um, and start easy. Start on that measurement strategy. And honestly, being here today um, is a great first step. You're going to hear a lot of great presenters. Um, on that note, the next presentation we have is Jordan Walburn. She is with Lucky Orange, which is a website optimization tool. We love Lucky Orange. We use them for a lot of our client implementations for hypothesis testing. So she has a really great presentation. She's gonna be talking about um, some easy ways to solve your website issues that you're running into. And the presentation will talk a little bit about Lucky Orange, but it's more about hypothesis testing and website testing in general and not the platform itself. So even regardless of whatever tool you use, it's going to be really beneficial, I hope. So um, on that note, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to be back at top of the hour. We have about six minutes, and I'm going to go ahead and get Jordan all set up. So again, thank you for joining us today. We'll be back soon. Resume the recording. Awesome. Well, I am so excited for this presentation. I gave a little bit of an intro at the end of my last time, but I'm going to go ahead and do it again.